Yeah, it's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker today, a man who was uh, actually his whole family, who was very instrumental uh, in the start of Cornerstone Church, and we cannot thank him enough. Five years ago, last Saturday, actually, he preached the first sermon at Cornerstone Church. We were at the university then, and how many people were with us that evening? It was a Saturday evening. Look at what the Lord is doing, okay? There is nothing that we can take credit for here, okay? Absolutely nothing. God is good, and uh, we are so blessed. Um, he said that I could tell some stories about him. I, didn't you say that? that? I could tell some st Angry Apple? You didn't say that. Okay. I won't tell any stories. Um, but I'll tell you what, when, uh, when this church started, I gave him a call, and I said, Jeff, would you be interested in, in being our pastor on Saturday nights? He said, hmm, yeah, sure. <laughs> He's the district attorney for Jefferson County, and at that point, he was this far involved in a, in a court case, and it would have been very easy for him to say, I'm sorry, but I can't. But he didn't. He said, sure. And uh, that first message that he brought uh, was about the church. And the key point that he made that night was, if you're going to be like just, if you're going to be just like every other church, then go and be in every other church. Don't even bother with this. And uh, I'll tell you what, we have, we were blessed for three months uh, for Jeff to come every Saturday, open the Word of God, and preach it. And uh, I must tell you that that um, if you're looking for light and fluffy today, I was in the last service. You're not going to get it, but he's going to open God's Word, and it's going to be. Um, you're, you're going to be blessed by the end of today's service. Would you please welcome Jeff Burkett. Thank you. No squeal this time. No squeal. The last time the microphone squealed, and I thought I was electrified for a moment there. It is a joy to be back here again. <clears throat> One thing I knew was going to happen for sure today was I was going to get a lot of hugs from a lot of people that I love very dearly, and that has happened. And by the way, if you haven't given me one and you know me, you owe me. It's hard for me to believe it's been five years since every Saturday night during that summer of 2012 since I got to deliver the Word of God to you. That is a precious time in my memory. Um, I will always treasure it. And I thank you for the privilege to come back today and deliver the Word of God again today. <clears throat> you know, when I get done preaching, I feel really, really battered and just tired. And I've already done it once today. And I thought, wow, I'm tired. i got to do that again. <laughs> now, if you haven't heard so already, you might find out that my style of preaching is somewhat confrontational. Okay? It's somewhat hard-hitting. And, uh, but I got to confess to you that even though I tend to give those kinds of messages, I wake up a lot of times in the morning I'm going to preach like this morning when I woke up at five o'clock in the morning and my first thought that came into my head was, Jeff, what are you thinking, man? Why? Can't you just preach something easy that everyone's going to just go, oh yeah, yeah, love and yeah. No, no, I didn't pick that, okay? But let me tell you something. When I get the opportunity to preach, I tend to preach the sermons that I need to hear. See, I got to preach this to me first, and it convicted me, and it hurt, and now I get to bless you by doing the same thing to you. <laughs> See, one thing that you find out from God's Word is that when you study God's Word, if you read through it, it is an antidote against complacency because God's Word is challenging. It's powerful. It's effective. It's like a double-edged sword that divides joint from marrow. Now, a little background. I just got reelected to my sixth term as Jefferson County District Attorney and one, no applause. And uh, one of the major agenda items I have is... I, I've come to realize that I have a foot planted in both worlds. See, I have a foot planted in the system that is full of people who are broken and hurting and ravaged by drug addiction, prisoners of the pain of child abuse, 
And I get to deal with those people all the time, and I work within a system that, frankly, does not have the answers. It doesn't have them. Okay? At the very best, what we do is we give behavior modification. That's what we do, behavior modification. There's a lot of work for social workers to do, but people need the church. See, right now, I want you to know some. You don't need to go across an ocean to find a mission field. I want you to know that. You don't need to go somewhere else, to another country. And so I have my other foot planted firmly in the foot of the church. And I've got a holy indignation saying the church needs to step into the pain of this world and deal with hurting, messy people whose lives are a train wreck, whose only solution is the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't realize that what they really need is forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. That's what they really, really need. But for the church to be ready for this, it better be committed. And I'm not saying committed to people. I'm saying committed to its Savior committed to its Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings me to today's passage. Put on your seatbelts. Here we go. Luke 14. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 14. And we are going to be starting with verse 25. And we are going to begin to learn about the life that Jesus demands of us, the worship that he deems acceptable. See, we worship God this morning mainly with our lips. We worshiped him with our pockets, our, bo- our uh, wallets. But God demands worship with our entire lives. And we get a glimpse of that from the words of Jesus in Luke 14. Starting in verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, And brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish? Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple." God, I pray that you would speak through your word today. I pray that you would use this sinner, this sinful man, and that you will help me to faithfully proclaim your words. Take all of me out of it. Make it all be of you. God, set our hearts on fire by the preaching of your word. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the first thing that jumps out at me in this passage, and it's a, it's a thing that easily could have escaped our notice, because there's so many things in this passage that are provocative, that just reach out and grab us by the throat. But we want to not miss the first thing that we see in this passage, and it's this, that great crowds, great crowds are following Jesus. Great crowds. See, at this point in his ministry, Jesus was popular. He was popular. People wanted to come and check him out. Now, we know this. We know that at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, there weren't many people following him. People weren't signing up for that program. They weren't following him to his death when it seemed like all their dreams about the Messiah were crashing. They didn't want to check in with the authorities who were killing Jesus to sign up for that same program, kill me too. No, they weren't into that. Nobody was signing up for that. But earlier in his ministry, we see great crowds following him. We see him feeding 5,000 people. 
And when we read that account, we know that that doesn't include women and children. So actually, there were many thousands more following him at that point. And so we see people who are very interested in this man that is doing amazing, powerful things. There is a big show in town, and they wanted to check it out. Now, from this passage, we can tell that since a lot of them didn't stick around for the end, since there were very few people sticking around the cross and watching him die the death he died for our sins, we know that there were probably a lot of people who were following Jesus around who were not following Jesus. Do you see that? You see the distinction? A lot of people were following him around looking for the show, but they weren't committed to him. And we can easily imagine today some of those reasons. See, human beings have always been addicted to entertainment, haven't they? We all like a good show. And we saw some real excitement in the gospel coming from Jesus. See, he was the new personality on the scene. He was talking like no man had ever talked before. He talked with authority, and his words had a power, and he was interesting, and he brought a new take, and he was confrontational. He would call out the Pharisees. He would do all kinds of things, and then he would do miraculous things. He would fill people's stomachs with just a few fish, 5,000 plus people, probably 15,000 people that he, that he fed them just using a few fish and a few loaves of bread. He was opening blind eyes. He was healing the sick. His touch was forming new limbs. He was taking away illnesses that had existed for many years. And you can understand why people were following him. If you were sick, if you needed a touch from God, you wanted to follow that man. You might not have been interested in committing to him, but you wanted to check him out. And he was doing the miraculous. He was turning water into wine, doing amazing things. Now, we know because of the end that a lot of people who were following him around, looking for his touch, looking for his miracles, looking for his display of his glory, they weren't following him because they had never committed to him because at the end, they weren't there. Now today, it's the same thing. There are a lot of people who follow Jesus around today who aren't following Jesus today. People follow him around for many reasons. People come and become church members for the companionship to have a church family, to enjoy fellowship. There's a lot of benefits to that. There's a social life. And there's many other benefits to coming to be part of the family of God. And the irony is, is that true life can only be found in him when you truly commit to him. But there are many people today who follow him around without committing to him and actually following him. Now, how do I know that? There's a couple reasons. Number one, there's a lot of evidence in our culture, but I firmly look to the Word of God first. And one of the scariest passages of Scripture in the entire Word of God is when Jesus speaks in Matthew 7, and he says this. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? In other words, people engaging in ministry. And this is what Jesus says back. He says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, now we live in a culture where many people have made shallow professions of faith. There was a study done by George Barna a few years ago. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it was a survey looking at the state of Christianity in America. And a large percentage of Americans claim to be Christians. A large percentage. And a large percentage claim to be born again. But listen to this. A large percentage of the people who claim to be born again also stated that they didn't really believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. Denying 
a key aspect of the gospel. And based on the passage that we're going to study today, I believe there are many people, especially in the United States of America, where the cost is low to becoming a Christian. It's getting higher. The heat's getting turned up. But in other countries, which I'll talk about later, the cost is high. But based on the passage we're studying today, I believe there's a lot of people who think they know Jesus. They think they know him. They may have raised a hand. They may have walked down an aisle. But they never committed to him. And nothing of eternal significance happened because their words were empty of commitment. Jesus didn't care about big crowds. He didn't care about popularity. Jesus didn't care about being popular. Now, in our modern day thinking, we might be thinking to ourselves, wow, Jesus has a big crowd to talk to. This is great. This is a chance to look really appealing. This is a chance to attract people who are checking him out, who are curious. Jesus, you might really want to say something encouraging to them, something that's really going to draw them in. Cast that net, Jesus. Jesus, you might want to say things that really connect to their needs. Show them that you are the solution for their needs, their financial problems, their marriage problems, the pain of their past. We would definitely not want Jesus to push them away, would we? Would we want that? We wouldn't want to... We want Jesus to say things that were offensive, that would push people away. We would think, bad move. Bad move, Jesus. Don't do that. But we see in this passage that Jesus does the exact opposite. He does the exact opposite. His message, and you can't look at it any way differently, his message is clearly designed to push away people who are so superficially following him that are not willing to commit to him. It's meant to push him away. Now, why is that? Number one, Jesus is the ultimate truth teller. See, the word of God says he's the way, the truth, and the life. When John summarized his glory in the gospel of John, he summarized it this way. He said Jesus was full of grace and truth. Think about that. The glory of Jesus Christ summarized in one phrase, full of grace, full of truth. And Jesus never compromised one to be the other. He never compromised truth to be grace. Never. And we see Jesus being truthful. He's a truth teller. In fact, we see it other places in the gospel as well. Jesus has a man come up to him. It's recorded in Luke. And says, I will follow you wherever you go. Sounds a lot like Peter, right? I'll never deny you. Man comes up to him and says, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. And we would think, hey, Jesus ought to say, great. I want you on the team. Come alongside. The more the merrier. Let me show you the way. You know what Jesus' response was? Jesus says, you know what? Foxes have holes. Birds have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. (laughs) In other words, you want to follow me? Guess what, bud? It ain't easy. It's not an easy road. You're not going to have an easy, painless road. Uh, Elsewhere, Jesus says this to his would-be followers. He says, you know what? You follow me, the world's going to hate you. It's going to hate you. The world system, the world way of thinking is going to be completely contrary to the way you think. Some of you are going to die. Oh, by the way, if you want to be great in my kingdom, if you want to have high status and stature, then you've got to be a lowly servant. Lowly. You need to become the servant of all. You need to be the one on their knees, serving other people, doing the lowly things. That is what makes you great in my kingdom. And oh, by the way, you're going to have to love your enemies. How many of you like that one? I always find that that is a really nice commandment, and I think it's really great until I start to put faces with that. Then it's not as fun. I don't like it as much. But you see in Jesus, there's no manipulation. 
There's no trying to seduce people by promising them benefits. But what he tells them is the cost. See, sometimes we confuse two things. We know God's grace is free. It's a, we can never earn salvation, but we confuse that and we don't realize that following Jesus will cost you everything. All your rights. We'll get into that. So what's the first cost he outlines? Cost number one. Verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife, and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. Don't those words hang heavy? Now, let me clear a few things up before you start to throw things at me, okay? Ladies, put down your purses. Don't throw things at me, okay? Bald head, it'll show marks. God wants us to abundantly, supernaturally, and in a Holy Spirit-empowered way, love our families, he wants that. His word is clear about that. God's word teaches an incredible, agape, self-sacrificing love that we are to show one another. We are taught to honor our fathers and our mothers. We are taught to love our wives like Christ loves the church who he gave himself up for and died for. In 1 Timothy, we're told that anyone who does not take care of their families is worse than an unbeliever. And you know about the one another's of Scripture. We're taught to love one another, bear each other's burdens, submit to one another, treat others as more important than yourselves. So how do we reconcile these passages? Well, we get some insight from the parallel passage in Matthew where Jesus says this, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, hatred in this passage is not the hatred we think of. It is actually loving less. What Jesus is teaching us here is that he demands that we love him so much that our love for the most dear human relationships that we have is like hatred in comparison. Think about that. Jesus Christ demands complete supremacy in your life. He will have no other gods before him. He'll have no other people before him. He wants all of your devotion, all your love. The irony is that when you love him most, you can love others best. But he demands that you yield all human relationships. And think about that. If you are commanded to love your wife like Christ loves the church and you're told that that love is to be like a hatred compared to how much you love him, the bar is high. He has set the bar very high. Can human relationships get in the way of serving and loving Jesus? Oh yeah, you know that they can. Why do you think the Bible warns us so much about being unequally yoked? Kids, young adults, please take my advice. If you are a Christian, do not marry a person who does not love Jesus Christ with all their heart and is not committed to them because you are going to bring sorrow and agony and misery upon yourself and you will not be able to serve Christ the way you have been called to because you will be pulling in opposite directions. The person who mo means most to you does not matter to the other. If you're already in a marriage where that is the case, God calls us to win them over by our conduct, but that's a separate sermon for another day. But this is a question we all have to ask ourselves. Do we find our comfort and our satisfaction in this life, in the human relationships around us, or do we find it in Jesus Christ? Because ultimately, that's where we're called to find it. And if we love others above Christ, it's going to affect your ability to serve them. Are you going to have difficult conversations to spur other people on to knowing him? If you're worried about whether they like you or not? If you're worried about whether your reputation is going to be harmed? Think about this. 
And it, this was very interesting to me because after the first service, I talked to a man who had this exact experience. Think about a person who is a Jew, a person who's a Jew who seeks to become a Christian. They know automatically that they are going to pay the price of their family. It's done. Because a Jew who converts, many times their families will have a funeral for them. It is though they have died, they will completely disown them. Muslims sometimes will seek to kill those who have been converted. But even though we may not pay a dramatic cost like that, God demands that we follow Jesus and we make him preeminent in all things. The second cost, your life. How about that one? Your life. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is clearly addressing two things here. Number one, he's talking about your physical life, your desire to continue to breathe and exist and live. And number two, he's talking about your life in the sense of when we say, I like my life right now, or I don't like my life right now. In other words, all the things that our lives consist of, like our homes, our relationships, our jobs, our incomes, our stuff, our possessions, our hobbies, our interests, the food we eat, the use of our time. In other words, the lifestyle to which we have become accustomed. Now, Jesus is saying that if you are his, if you truly belong to him, you will love him far more than you value your own life. You'll be willing to die for him if it's necessary, and your love for all your earthly interests will seem like hatred compared to your love for him. Now, ironically, Jesus says elsewhere in Luke that those of us who grasp onto our lives dearly, the things we love, are the ones who are going to lose it. Those are the ones who are going to stand condemned because we never were willing to give up those things. He says, forever, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Is your life marked by saving your life? In other words, are you chasing the same things the world is chasing? See, a lot of Christians blend in really well with the world. We chase the same things. We covet the same things. We desire the same things. We just look like those around us, and occasionally we sprinkle a little Jesus into it. A true disciple has Christ as his priority. You know the concept in the Bible that says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. A good little exercise for y'all to do this week is to look at your checkbook. Look at your checkbook because where your treasure is, is where your heart is. I can guarantee you that if I have the chance to look at your checkbook, I'm not asking to. Okay? If I have the chance to look at your finances, I can tell you everything I need to know about you. And believe me, I get to do that in my job. I look at some of those things, those records. I can tell what you love. I can tell what you love most. I can tell who you love. I can tell everything about you. But Jesus really drives home the concept when he says this. And we may not understand this concept in our modern day, through our modern day eyes, because the allusion he makes is not one that's common in our day. But when he says this, he says, you are going to need to bear your own cross and come after me if you want to be my disciple. Let me tell you right now, those words would have been like a jackhammer to the chest of the people who were listening to Jesus. What did that mean? Well, number one, crucifixions weren't very common in our, aren't very common in our day. But a couple years before Jesus gave this sermon, just a few years before, a band of rebels had been put together by a man named Judas, not the Judas from our Gospels. And they had brought an uprising against the Roman government. 
And the Romans easily knocked that uprising down. But in order to teach the Jews a lesson, a Roman general ordered the crucifixion of 2,000 Jews. And their crosses lined the roads of Galilee as a public display of why you should not defy Rome. Now think about that. Think about the horrific sight that that was. If you've seen the movie Spartacus, you may have some idea. Now, when Jesus uses this example, he is saying a couple very distinct things. The imagery of carrying our own cross carried the overtone of two things, death and submission. Death and submission. Number one, death. You're going to need to die to yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. You pick up your cross and follow me. You're going to die to your own agenda, to self. The cross symbolized death, painful death. But the more important message was submission. You see, when the Romans crucified somebody to punish them, they wanted the person's final public act to be the act of willingly carrying their cross to the place of their own execution. It was Rome's way of showing people that your final act, whether you want to or not, is going to be to show total surrender and submission to Rome. You're going to submit. And Jesus, when he says you're going to pick up your cross, you're going to carry it, you're going to follow me, he's in a very not subtle way telling his would-be followers that he wants our absolute, complete, and total submission to him and his rightful authority over our lives. There's one more sense that the cross is important as an illustration. You see, the cross was a criminal's death. You realize that? It was a criminal's death. It was intentionally meant to humiliate, to disgrace, degradation, and shame was the goal of a cross. And so there's a sense that Jesus is saying, are you willing, are you willing to become nothing for me? See, that's what Jesus did for us. He died a criminal's death. He humbled himself even to death, death on a cross. And he's saying by saying, pick up and carry your cross, are you willing to become nothing? Are you willing to be unpopular? Are you willing to be marginalized? Are, or is your popularity, is your reputation, is it too precious to you? Is pleasing me enough or do you need the praise of men? That's his message. Now, this is not a weak commitment he's calling us to. Do you agree? Amen? <laughs> yeah, I don't like it any more than you do sometimes. <laughs> this is not a weak commitment. Jesus' words are telling people basically, don't come to me in a half-hearted way. If you come to me, bring it all. Now, do you notice that how Satan is the exact opposite? He's the exact opposite opposite. Satan promises the best. He promises the best and he delivers misery, destruction, and death. He encourages you to indulge in everything you want. Pleasure, money, no restrictions. But Christ, the good shepherd, he offers eternal life, abundant life, life without end. But he promises you there's trouble ahead. The road is hard. And Jesus wants you to count the cost. He wants you to deliberately count the cost. He doesn't want you to go into this blind. He doesn't want to deceive you and make a hasty decision. First example, he says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. He talks about sitting down, which implies a careful, unhurried, deliberative process. This is rational. Jesus does not want you to check your brain at the door. 
He wants you to come with deliberation and commit it all to him. Why? Because he wants us to build a tower. He wants us to build a tower, a life that is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He will do beautiful things with your life. He will do amazing things with your life. When you build it on his firm foundation, when you rely and trust in him and undertake everything to bring him glory, to bring him honor, he'll do that. But he's also saying, it's better for you to not begin that journey if you aren't going to finish. You will be mocked. And it's better for you to not claim to be a Christian than to make that claim and then bring dishonor and disgrace to the name of Jesus Christ, dragging his name through the mud like so many people who claim his name do. You've seen it on TV. How does the world react when a Christian falls? How does the world react? The world celebrates it. The world rejoices. They mock, just like in Jesus' example. They love it when a person who claims to be a Christian fails in an epic way. They mock the hypocrisy of it all. So Jesus says, count the cost before you come. I'm worth it, but you count the cost. What are the costs? Let's talk about them. What are the costs of following Jesus? Well, number one, when you commit to knowing him, loving him, bowing your knee to his lordship in your life, the battle against sin has now begun. Because let me tell you what, before you bow your knee to him and his lordship, there's no battle against sin. You do whatever you feel like doing. The only test you ask yourself is, does this please me? Does this feel good? I will do it. There's no restraints. There's no battle. But when you become his, the war has begun. We now want to please him. We now want to live our lives in honor and obedience to him. But we've got this sinful flesh still hanging from our bones. The battle begins. And he'll give you everything you need to fight that battle successfully. But there will be some painful struggle. Number two, the denial of self. The giving up of our agenda. You know, there's a song. It's an old song sang by Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. That's not a Christian song. <laughs> it's not. Because my way is no longer an option. See, we give up our agendas, our plans, and our lives are to be in submission to God. We used to be the captain of our ship. Now every decision needs to be filtered by the consideration, will this bring God glory? Is this pleasing to God? Is this the best use of God's resources and time, money? Will it please him? How about this one? Our reputation. Being a Christian, especially one who is sold out, one who speaks for Christ, one who lives for Christ, one who lives in complete opposition to the value system of this world, is not all that popular in the U.S. of A. anymore. Have you noticed? There's a news story just recent within the last week. Some of your favorite politician, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Bernie Sanders recently in a hearing was questioning someone who, is, who has been appointed to an office. And he's a Christian. He's a devout Christian. And he believes that Christ is the only way to God. And Bernie Sanders kept questioning him on that. And he talked about the fact that, are you saying Muslims are condemned? And at the end of the hearing, Bernie Sanders made the statement that this person is not the kind of person this country is all about. It's common. Cost isn't as high as it could be, but it's, it's raising. Here's another cost. You no longer have exclusive claims on your money when you come to Christ. See, we are called to be a generous people who acknowledge that all of our money, all of our possessions are his. He owns them. We're just stewards. He owns them. They're his. We just get to use them. 
And he calls us to take care of others. He calls us to fund the work of his kingdom. It's not your money. And when you become his, you acknowledge that. You no longer have an exclusive claim on your time anymore. It's not your time. You're a steward of it as well. He's now Lord over your time. And if I'm preaching this message in some countries, it may cost you your actual physical life. By the way, do you think a person is more likely to truly count the cost if they're living in the Middle East, if they're living in China, than if they live in the United States of America? Oh, yeah. A pastor once said that it's hard to tell a true believer from a false one in America because the price isn't as high. But in other countries, they don't have false conversions. Nobody willingly signs up for a program that could take their life or imprison them unless they're the real deal. And the question we need to ask ourselves is that if it was a legitimate concern and worry that there were going to be authorities busting down the doors in this place and coming in and taking us under arrest, how many of us would be here? How many of us would be here? You see, Jesus wants finishers. He doesn't want people who are just going to start strong and fizzle out. He wants people who will finish strong, commit fully, and carry through. The second, second example he gives, what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet one who comes against him with 20? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. See, one of the things that you may have realized it when you bowed your knee to Jesus, if you did, and you may not have, was that you entered a war. You realize that? You entered into a war, the cosmic war of the ages. It's a spiritual war. And if you don't believe me, read Ephesians 6, where it talks about the armor of God and how we have to strap on all of his armor to be able to fight this war. And we know that we will be victorious, but we also know this, we can sustain some serious injuries in this war. You're going to get bruised. You're going to get battered at times. And Christ warns us in this example, it is better for you to not enter this war at all than to make a half-hearted commitment and then go AWOL when the fighting gets hot. I'm thankful that Jesus wasn't subtle. Because he ends this particular teaching by saying, hey, just in case you didn't get what I said already, I'm going to make it as painfully obvious as I can. And in verse 33, he says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Hey, just in case I wasn't clear, I'm telling you, you have to be willing to give up everything. John MacArthur says this. He says, Jesus was telling them that he demanded absolute, unconditional surrender. He's telling them that they will keep no privileges, make no demands, keep no cherished sins, treasure no earthly possessions, cling to no secret self-indulgences. Their commitment is without reservation. They have no rights when it comes to Jesus. Are you willing to give up all your rights when it comes to Jesus? Now, the thing that I do not want to get lost in a message like this, because this is a message about the cost, okay? But one thing I want to be absolutely clear is that knowing Jesus, loving him, submitting to him is absolutely, completely worth it. And it's a small price it's a small price to pay compared to what he does for us. It's worth any cost. There's no price too high. And it's nothing compared to what he paid for us. Jesus says this in Matthew 13. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold everything that he had and bought it. 
because you see that once you realize that Jesus is worth everything, you're willing to give him everything you have. The Apostle Paul. Do, does anybody think Paul suffered for the kingdom? I mean, read the word of God. You see, he was shipwrecked and beaten and got the 39 lashes multiple times, which would have just about killed him every time. He was left for dead, stoned, every kind of beating and hardship imaginable. But you know what Paul says? Paul says that these are light and momentary afflictions that are building up a weight of glory. He says this too. He says in Romans 1, our present sufferings are not worthy of being compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. So the price is high, but it's really nothing. Okay, here's the responses. If you're a believer, you've heard the words of Jesus. If nothing else, you heard his word as brought to you right out of the Bible. Heck, I could have sat down after I read that passage and you would have come away with something. You've heard the words of Jesus. Submit fully to his lordship. Look over your life and see if there is any area of your life that is not in complete and full submission to his lordship. That's what you need to do. Let there be no area of your life that you're not freely offering up to him. Some of you might be saying, you know what? It's not really hard following Jesus like you're talking about. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that. It, it doesn't seem like it's that hard. And maybe that's because you're not following him hard. Let that sink in. It might be because you're not following him hard. Maybe you're taking no risks. Maybe you're not standing for him. Maybe you're not being his witness. Maybe you're not giving at all. But the church will only become effective when it's packed with real disciples. And there's work for us to do. I hope you see it. You don't need to go across a pond, an ocean, to find broken people who need a savior. People who need God's people to love them, cry with them, bind up the brokenhearted, put salve on their wounds, and lead them to becoming disciples of Jesus. But if we don't love Jesus first and most, we will do nothing of eternal value. See, our commitment's not to people first. It's to him first. Now, if you're unsure, some of you may have thought you accepted Christ as your savior, but right now, you're not so sure. Or maybe you sit here today knowing he's not your Lord. I want you to consider his greatness I want you to consider that you, like all of us, are, an are a wretched, unworthy sinner deserving, undeserving of his grace and that he offers you forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin, forgiveness and freedom from the bondage of sin, reconciliation with him, friendship with him, peace, love, joy, eternal life, and every lasting blessing. But you need to count the cost count the cost because when you come, he wants all of you. And I hope you'll believe on him, repent of your sins and receive him. Amen. I'm going to pray. God, your word is powerful. Your word makes great claims about itself. It's, it's the power of God unto salvation. And God, I'm limited in my understanding. I'm flawed. I see things through a sin veil. But God, your word will endure forever. Your word is living. It's active. It divides joint from marrow. It's powerful. Your word promises us that it will not return void. It will always accomplish what it's meant to do. And we thank you for that promise, Lord. I thank you for your word for how it challenges us, how it keeps us from being complacent. And God, I pray that today, through the preaching of your word, that you will set hearts on fire to realize that every cost of following you is worth it. God, call people. Call people to your side. 
empower, quicken their spirits. And God, make us all disciples who one day we will be able to stand before you and hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you, God. I pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen.